Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones coming to you with a new video on another fascinating spray foam topic. Today we're going to review can the spray foam break free? You know, break free of the substrate, break free of the studs, uh, break free of that which it's been adhered to. That's a really good question and there is a popular misconception that the building can become far more flexible than what the foam is capable of keeping up with. Before we get into any details, I want to thank everybody that has subscribed and checked out the channel, checked out the playlists, and uh, commented and shared these videos with uh, their clientele or people that are making decisions. I really appreciate it. That's what this is about, education and helping others. All right, on to this question. This is primarily a closed cell question. Um, open cell foam has no adhesion or cohesion studies done to a standard because it's a light fluffy product and there's no way that you can clamp onto it and actually do an adhesion test uh, certification for it. It is primarily a spray in place alternative to fiberglass insulation. It does stick to what it's sprayed to but there's no standard reference that it has to meet. And the primary reason is that it's not going to be ever sought out as an air barrier material. Whereas the closed cell foam is an air barrier material. Now, to my American friends, you don't have a nationalized standard across the United States yet. You're getting one. You're going to get your ASTM standard soon in the coming years. And with it, there will be adhesion and cohesion references. So for now, I'm going to use the Canadian standards so that you have an idea of what they test, why, and how it backs things up, because those are going to be probably engrafted some way, somehow, into your ASTM uh, report and qualifications. Some people think that the closed cell foam, the medium density foam, is so rigid that their metal building or their wood building is going to expand and contract and do all of these things and the closed cell foam is going to break free from it and nothing could be further from the truth because we wouldn't be able to be an air barrier material and we certainly wouldn't be a very good urethane if the second that the building tried to move we broke free plus building movement uh, when you don't have a laminated substrate laminated product to the substrate studs metal wood, brick, masonry, whatever it happens to be, the building is going to move before you put this glue on it. So the very idea that the entire structure can start to move independent uh, and break free from the adhesion of the adhesive, the glue, the foam. And I'm going to use this wording a bit to, to get your mind wrapped around it. Urethane foam, closed cell foam, is adhesive. Right? Urethane is one of the most constru uh, popular construction adhesives in the world. So let's take a look at some simple test reports that are going to show us what we look for in the foam, how it adheres, how much it'll move, how much it won't, back that up with some facts, see if we can't prove this thing out. So exhibit number one in our uh, analysis of adhesion is knowing what the standard is that even exists to see if the foam can pass adhesion testing. So this is the spray applied rigid polyurethane foam report for closed cell foam. It's the master standard that all foams, wall tight, Demolec, you name it, needs to meet for closed cell medium density. And we're gonna scroll down a little ways here where we can see the tensile strength. Okay, here we go. Tensile strength. So the minimum, this column represents minimum, is 200 kilopascals. Now, I don't speak in kilopascals either. I uh, see, I'm just scrolling up here. The minimum, the column states minimum requirements. There is no maximum because as long as you pass it, they don't care. So you can, you can go to infinity. So what is 200? I had to look it up. It's 29 PSI. So it needs 
a minimum of the 29 pounds per square inch of force to be able to remove the closed cell foam off of the substrate. So you've seen uh, video, and I've got it here rolling, where we've gone in and done the adhesion pull test where we, we cut a plug, we take a plug cutter, this is how they determine 29 PSI, they have a plug cutter, you attach a disc, the disc goes onto a fish gauge, and as long as the plug doesn't pull out of the, the area that you've cut it free from, uh, before you get to the 29 or greater than PSI, you've passed. So in most situations, we can't. We can't even get it out. We can max the fish gauge out and start yanking on the thing, and it still won't come out. So with 29 PSI of force, the building is not going to be able to move and create 29 PSI of uh, backwards force to the substrate f upwards or forwards to break it free from a 2x4, a 2x6, a steel stud, a hollow block masonry wall, a brick wall, you name it. Okay, whatever, whatever substrate you want to do, it's not going to, unless the adhesion was compromised to begin with due to a foreign contaminant on the substrate. That's something different, provided you have installed it properly. But let's, uh, let's check this out on a racking strength report because I, I really like seeing the, uh, the test reports and we've got some really good data here on that. So we're going to switch to that here in right now. Okay, so here's the racking strength report BASF did, and we'll see how they set the test up. Three wall designs, two by fours with double top plate, 16 on center. It had one inch of polystyrene, and then it was batted. A two by six wall with double top plate, 24 on center spacing, R20 batted, and then a two by four wall. wall uh, Single top plate, 24 on center spacing with three inches of closed cell foam in it. So we're going to skip to the uh, data results of the deflection test. Uh, I guess it would be important to understand that here's the, uh, here's the wall assembly, and then they have a device that puts force down on the wall to see how much deflection there's going to be. So they're loading it with weight from the top down and then seeing how much uh, deflection or squish the wall is going to have. Here is our report and I'll highlight what we've got here. We have got in yellow the batted 2x6 wall double top plate uh, six, uh, 20, 24 on center spacing, 2 by 6s and batted. Then we have in the middle here in the uh, purple, we have a single plate, 2 by 4 wall batted. And then finally, the blue wall here is the 2 by 4 wall, single plate, 3 inches of closed cell foam. This is what we want to see. At about 17, I'm going to say 1700. Uh, pounds per foot of force on the test wall they're getting 1.94 millimeters of deflection on the spray foam wall whereas they're getting 7.27 millimeters of deflection on the 2x6 double top plate wall with no foam in it now to put this into American terms uh, 7.27 millimeters is 0.286 of an inch, so greater than 30 thou, greater than a quarter of an inch, so quarter of an inch of deflection. The closed cell foam wall 2x4 without extra reinforcements is deflecting 1.94 millimeters, so that's 0 0.076 of an inch. So the difference between the closed cell foam 2x4 and the batted 2x6 with an extra plate of lumber is 375%. That's just on the raw data. But the, the spray foam one is done with less dimensional lumber. It's done with a 2x4 and not an extra plate, whereas this is done with a 2x6 and an extra plate. 
So it's 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 much greater than just three hundred and seventy five percent. So you tell me how if the spray foam can withstand the adhesion of that much deflection, three hundred and seventy five percent difference in deflection between non foam and foam. There's no way. There's absolutely no way that the building can create enough deflection and movement within its assembly wall roof uh ceiling floor um there's no way that the building is going to be able to move enough under normal circumstances of normal loads and normal engineering it cannot move expand contract or take enough live load to break free of the spray foam we've just seen it we've put it into a situation with an extreme amount of weight this is why the spray foam can be uh, carrying a certification number for air barrier material. Now I'm going to show you a picture which is going to back this up. Now this is an example of the power of what the spray foam can do. There's two things we need to learn from this. One, how to properly restrain your framing details and the second, just how much can the spray foam move or not move. You're looking at a drop-down ceiling detail. There's living space above this. This is a garage. This is the, the man door in and out, personnel door in and out of the garage. This is the division wall between the house and the garage. So to our left is the house and living space, and to the right in here is the garage. A drop-down design has been done so that all the plumbing and all the ductwork can be above the spray foam in a makeshift warm zone. The builder did not fasten enough screws and nails into this 2x6 when we sprayed it and as a result once the spray foam was installed and it cooled and it contracted because it, it's not shrinkage it's contraction it goes on hot it's volumetrically a greater mass when we first install it than after it cools down and after it cooled it contracted and adhered so well to the 2x6 plate that it pulled the plate, which didn't have enough mechanical reinforcement against the wall, away from the wall. I have seen this from time to time when framing details have been poorly installed or insufficiently installed, let's say. So the situation would have been remedied, first of all, if they had put enough screws and bolts into this. But as a result, you can see where it's been fastened at the edges and minimal, minimal fastening. And the foam has pulled this. So you can see just how much deflection the 2x6 can do. And you can see how much deflection and movement the spray foam can handle. Now this is... This is a failure as far as the envelope is concerned, but it wasn't um, caused and instigated by us. We have to go back and fix it for the customer, and I told the customer right away, from here on forward, make sure your framers are putting more screws and nails into the lumber so it's restrained properly. This will be fixed with can foam. But this gap here is upwards of an inch. I didn't put a tape measure on it. Upwards of an inch to an inch and a quarter. It's showing you the power of the deflection. It's showing you the power of the adhesion of the foam and how much the foam can actually cause things to move. So there's no way, folks, if you expect, you would never expect your lumber to move this much, right? You don't want your lumber moving five, six, eight percent. Your lumber's supposed to be staying in place. So there's absolutely no way that your 2x6, your 2x8, your 2x4s, your wood, your steel, whatever you're going to be putting, your masonry wall up, there's no way that that wall is going to be able to move enough to break free of the foam. The foam's going to move with it, it's going to stay with it, it's going to back it up. Now, something on the idea of the structure, a metal structure being able to move and crack free from the foam. When the foam is adhered to metal buildings, folks, it stops the metal buildings from excessively expanding and contracting. You want this. Think of a garage door panel. The panels held together and structurally sound as one piece by the urethane foam inside of it. So a roof is restrained with spray foam, a metal roof, a metal structure on the walls, anywhere. The building is 
glued together with this adhesive and it stops the metal from expanding and contracting excessively and slotting out the holes and wrecking uh, trim or um, mostly it's water integrity and air air integrity roofs have a habit of slotting out the screw holes over time and ex rapid expansion and contraction over many years the sl the holes become oblonged and then if a gasket is not sealing them up as well that's where their their point of leakage is going to start at so the spray foam stops all of that and i am a firm believer that the number one thing that we want on a metal building first and foremost is solid adhesion a solid envelope and this whole uh, open discussion that is out there about where well, we want to be able to replace panels and replace roofing well okay fine but that's only secondary to the first and most important thing which is getting a primary envelope established an air seal established and an air barrier established now this is not a metal building video I'll do a separate video on that at some point but understand that your spray foam closed cell medium density two pound foam is not going to break free of your substrate, your studs, your metal building, provided that it was put on at the right temperature, the right um, hum uh, substrate prep, meaning if it needs to be primed, prime it, it needs to be clean, it needs to be dry, it needs to be free of dirt, it needs to be free of soot, it needs to be free of foreign contaminants that are going to compromise adhesion. Like, come on, you wouldn't come out and expect to paint a room in your house that's full of dust why would you go and spray your closed cell foam over something that's dusty and dirty and wet? So a little bit of common sense goes a long way, but I know these days common sense is in extremely short supply. So thank you for checking this out. If you just subscribed because of this video, thank you very much. Welcome to the Spray Jones family. Stay tuned. We're going to have many more great videos coming up this summer. Great project profiles, and we'll check you on the next one. Bye.